joyfully sing. Welcome to Discerning Truths of Bill Donahue. And uh, thanks for joining me and thanks for putting me up with my schedule. So those of you that uh, listen to Neo know I wasn't on there yesterday. It was just insane. I, there was no way I could do that. And last Friday I was not on. So I did the review of chapters 1 through 8 on Monday. So we're in chapter 9 today. And we'll, uh, you know, get that done. It, it should be good. And um, hopefully, uh, you know, the review helped out a little bit. So uh, with that, let's take care of some business. So uh, I am using my Kauai address as, a, as my regular address at this point. And this is a mailing address, cards, letters, books, anything you want to send over there. Hate mail, it all goes there. Uh, actually, hate mail goes to Profit Club Clowns <laughs> and Michael can get it. I'm just kidding. But... Um, any regular email goes to bill at discerningtruths.com. I'll take questions, differences of opinion. You want to make an argument for some other interpretation of Revelation, I'm fine. You can send it to that email. Uh, anything for the Profit Club, um, which we have postponed for so many months now, but it's just I haven't had a time to do it. And we are overwhelmed with... Uh, false prophets and false apostles and, and other things that the Prophet Club deals with. Um, so we probably have 10 episodes we could do right now with just the material we have. And Michael and I will try to get to the Prophet Club uh, and do another episode soon. And uh, But emails for that goes to prophetclubclowns at gmail. And I have put up a, uh, a link on these cards now to my Cloud Hub channel. Because Cloud Hub has all my replays. Uh, DLive keeps them for three days and then they're gone. Uh, Facebook, uh, the Nazis at Facebook mute me. Every time I go out there, I have to fight to have my uh, my audio turned back on. Uh, Cloud Hub is the, the freedom of speech platform where I can go and, and it actually keeps my, uh, my replays up there. So uh, I think you ought to start... Uh, we need to start migrating towards Clout Hub. I know the chat's still a work in progress, and uh, but at least have that link available for you. And then the show notes, anything I do, 
that's going to go up on the screen as a slide with notes and, and uh, scripture passages, that kind of thing. I put it into a PDF and I put it up on the discerning truth groups on the telegram program. So those are uh, places that you might want to know and, and be in contact with me and please do um, subscribe to the channel on D live or cloud hub or wherever you're listening. So you get notifications when I'm on. Um, but generally my schedule is Monday and Wednesday. I'm going to do uh, a book of the Bible right now. We're in revelation until we finish it. And on Friday, I try to do things that are outside what you're going to get taught in church. I think, of course, I don't think you're going to get taught any of uh, what I'm teaching about Revelation in church either. But um, we do that. I opted to schedule Friday for a review of chapters one through eight because I thought it was necessary. And then when I couldn't broadcast, I did it on Monday. Um, Neo, I, I should be back on with her next week. Um but right now, my schedule is uh, in, in the next 30 days is just absolutely crammed. Uh, so we will see that's going to be a little bit hit and miss with Neil. And hopefully I can keep broadcasting on my regular schedule. And if you haven't been going following Michael Beatty, Miguel California in the morning, God has added to his gifts. He has been a faithful person as a singer songwriter of God's word. And God has added to that gift, the ability to teach the Bible in a, in a new uh, way. That's very refreshing. I really enjoyed his teaching in Kings and now we're in Luke and uh, it's starting off as a lot of fun. That's 5 30 AM on Pacific time. And uh, when I'm in Kauai, I catch it on replay because I'm not generally up at two 30 in the morning, but uh, Michael is there and uh, I, you really need to, to listen to him if you're not a wonderful teacher. Like I said, we're in chapter 9 today. And with that, I always start off with uh, the introduction from Matthew Henry's commentary. Um, not that I always agree with Matthew Henry. In fact, I don't in, in many cases. But I like the way he breaks down his commentary. But today, it was super short. <laughs> he wrote the chapter contents. The fifth trumpet is followed by a representation of another star falling from heaven and opening the bottomless pit out of which comes swarms of locusts, verses 1 to 12. And the sixth trumpet is followed by the losing of, loosing of four angels bound at the great river Euphrates, chapters 13 to 21, end of his introduction. So uh, definitely pretty um, limited in what he shared. And I'm thinking that Possibly, and I explained this, Matthew Henry is a historicist. He comes from a, a historicist interpretive grid. That is the uh, the majority of the reformers and, and those people who held to a historicist interpretation of um, the book of Revelation. And Matthew Henry does. He's got a little bit of futurist in him, you know, but uh, he's primarily historicist. And this chapter is not going to fit well Um I don't think it fits well with this historicist interpretation. And that may be why you're getting such a short introduction and in this uh, his case. Each interpretive grid, whether you're preterist, partial preterist, uh, futurist, idealist, uh, you know, dispensational futurist, classical futurist, you know, wherever you're, you're amillennial or premillennial, all of those interpretive grids have problem passages and problem chapters. And this, this is uh, one of those chapters that I don't think the historicists do well in. And uh, it seems to be a stretch for me. And that what you find is when people write from this point of view, from any point of view, and they get to a problem passage, they just skip over it. and uh, Or they downplay it and, and move past and move past it pretty quickly. And you're going to see that here in his commentary that it's... Uh, it's not very deep in this section because it, it doesn't log in very well, right? It's just like when we did the seven churches, the seven letters to the seven churches, and I told you um, that some of those churches fit pretty well. The Church of Laodicea sure matches what we see today, but the Church of Philadelphia was hard to fit in the time frame that they put. The Church of Sardis was hard to fit in a lot of ways in what was going on. So there was problem um, 
places where it was trying to fit into that in historicist interpretation, but other places fit very well. And uh, so what you find is that people focus where it fits well and ignore where it doesn't fit, right? You know, and that's generally what's going on. So um, with that, we're going to start in uh, <clears throat> chapters one or verse one and two says, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth and he was given the key to the shaft at the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft at the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke and the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened and the smoke from with the smoke from the shaft. Okay. First thing I want you to notice is this pattern. You have a group of four, uh, four trumpets, followed by a group of two trumpets, and then that seventh trumpet is going to introduce the bowl judgments. There'll be a group of four bowl judgments, followed by two a group of two, and then the seventh uh, bowl judgment. You had four horsemen, right, in the six seals. You had the four horsemen, and then a group of two, and then the seventh seal introduces the trumpet judgment. That pattern goes through Revelation. It's one of my arguments why this is cyclical and it's going over the same information from multiple um, perspectives. And while each of the um, seals or trumpets and, and bowls may have some uh, linear timeline to, that they're following, some sense of that, that generally speaking, it, it it's the explaining the, what's happening during those uh, periods and then going over it in, in from a different perspective. So I highlighted first that a star fell from falling from heaven. <clears throat> and then we, you know, a lot of people say the star falling from heaven is Satan because Satan falls and we've seen angels represented as stars. And that may be correct. And, and it also may be another angel representing fallen man, right? We've seen representative angels in the, in heaven, and uh, this could be one that's fallen, or it could be Satan himself. But it's almost certainly the same, or at least a very similar angel to the one in Revelation 8.10, which is, like I said, I think that's the same angel in being presented with more information from a different perspective. I think it is Satan because Jesus uses virtually the same expression to describe Satan's judgment in Luke 10.18. Jesus says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning, right? And the Old Testament background to this is from Isaiah. What a surprise, right? Isaiah 14, uh, verses 12 to 15. And whoever this heavenly being is, he appears to be sovereign over the abyss of locusts in verses 1 to 3, because he has the ability to let them out. Now, he needs God's permission to do that. Even if, when we're talking about sovereignty, we're not talking ab absolute sovereignty. Nothing happens unless God allows it. God allowed Satan to tempt Job. He allowed things to happen. He, they're not sovereign outside of God, but this seems to be the uh, realm that he has power over. Now, the language of um, that I did in blue with the shaft of the bottomless pit and... Um, from the shaft wrote smoke and um, like the smoke of a great furnace. Okay. This is coming out of, uh, and it seems to be an allusion to Sodom and Gomorrah and the smoke that raised out of Sodom and Gomorrah. So what you're being pictured here is judgment. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah were judged with fire and brimstone and then the smoke comes out of it and their, their punishment. So in this bottomless pit, it's not a nice place. It's not like Abraham's bosom. The bottomless pit's a place of judgment. And that's what that smoke is is presenting. Will there be literal smoke? Well, probably not. But some people think there will be literal smoke coming out of a bottomless pit. But I just think it's uh, it's basically bringing up that imagery to show you. So that my question is, who's in the bottomless pit that's being let out? You know, you're letting somebody out. They had to be put there. Well. It's the angels or the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, okay? And Benai Elohim means sons of God. And it's, that's from Genesis 6, 1 to 4. The Benai Elohim looked on the daughters of men and saw that they were fair and came in and mated from them and they produced this Nephilim. 
and they get judged for it, and God puts them in the bottomless pit. And you know that from Jude 1, 6 and 2 Peter 2, 4. Okay? That's who's in there. So if you're letting something out of there, who are you letting out? I think it's logically the same thing, that those angels, those, whether whether it's right to call them, Jude and Peter call them angels, and angels means messengers or, or whatever. It's, it's more of a job description than it is a class of being. I'm going to call them celestial beings, that they're celestial beings that disobey God. They, when you read Genesis 6, they created, caused evil to be go through the whole earth. Whatever they were doing that Genesis doesn't explain, some other non-canonical books give you more information uh, about what was going on during the uh, thing. And what I mean non-canonical, they're not in the Bible. They're not scripture, but they could be, they could have truth in them. Okay, and I dealt with the book Enoch and the Epic of Gilgamesh and the book of Jasher and Jubilees. And these, these are not written, Enoch wasn't written by Enoch. It's not scripture. It was never in the Bible, but it can contain some truth. And it describes um, these watchers in the book of Enoch, the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, that they passed along to man forbid knowledge and that passing along that knowledge besides their little uh, indiscretions with human women that passing along that knowledge led to evil everywhere now it never explains what that forbidden knowledge is there's a lot of speculations about what it was but basically you have these uh benai elohim who get put in a bottomless pit and they have all kinds of power because they were able to create a world full of evil so evil that god created killed everybody on this planet except for eight people to stop it right to in an attempt to stop it that's pretty evil and and it says they're going to be released so then you have people picking from this the idea that you're going to have a return of the nephilim and that, that there's going to be more angels mating with humans it doesn't say that anywhere in this text okay now, verses 3 to 6 says, Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the um, power of the scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion and it, when it strings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Okay, I don't know if you've ever been stung by a scorpion, but it's a pretty painful sting. Okay, uh, think of a, uh, a wasp on steroids, right? You know, I mean, it, it is. It's so whatever these things are doing, they're afflicting men. Is that a literal sting, literal poison? And that, I don't favor that interpretation, but maybe it is, right? This is modeled after Exodus plagues, and you're going to see the book of Revelation follows Exodus plagues pretty uh, consistently. And um, it confirms that God is the one with absolute sovereignty over the instruments of the plague, as indicated by the uh, clause inducing the locust plagues in Egypt. Stretch out your hand, the God's hand, for the locusts, that they may come up to the land of Egypt. That's from Exodus 10. Uh, verses 12. But whereas the Exodus locusts harm the vegetation, these locusts do not harm the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those who don't have the seal of God on their forehead. The seal is given only to genuine believers. The seal is a sign of God's sovereignty, sovereign authority, and ownership over those uh, destined ultimately to be part of his kingdom and not Satan's domain. That means that the faith of Christians is safeguarded by God's protective presence. And then this is Beale saying he has more on this in Revelation 2, 17 and 7, 20, uh, 7 verses 2 to 3. And I give you the, the citation from Beale's Shorter Commentary, which I've been using extensively in this study. So understand this. There's a, a pattern. Chapter 5, we have saints underneath the altar of God saying, how much longer is this going to happen until you're going to redeem us? God, how much longer until you're going to um, judge the evil and judge the wicked? You see similar prayers 
in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, in Daniel, and, and those kind of books that they have these prayers asking God, how much longer are you going to let this evil empire, whatever it is, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, these evil empires exist before you uh, take a stand and, and, um, and set up your kingdom, Lord, what's going to happen? So that happened in chapter 5. And in chapter 6, we saw the uh, six of the seven seals, which was uh, God's answer to that. This is when it's going to happen. And then you see the saints represented as 24 elders. And, and uh, uh, they're no longer under the throne. They have white robes. They're good to go. And then you get into chapter um, 7. Now the wrath of God is being poured out on the ungodly because the wrath of God is not poured out on the godly. And that's a promise you're going to find in, uh, in Thessalonians. We are not destined unto wrath. So... If we're going to go through the tribulation, which is my position, and you're fine to hold a different one, but I, I think my position is based on Scripture, uh, because Jesus says in Matthew 24, 29 to 31, that he's coming immediately after the tribulation to gather his saints. I take Jesus as his word. If you have a passage that says Jesus is coming before the tribulation, just email it to me, because I haven't been able to find it. Okay? So... Uh, there's your answer. Now the wrath of God starts being poured out. You had the group of four of the trumpets in, in um, chapter 8, right? You had this little pause, a pause in heaven. We don't know how long the pause is. Uh, and then the wrath gets poured out. So between the sixth seal and the seventh seal being open, uh, between the seal judgments and, and the trumpet judgments, there's some kind of pause, some kind of delay uh, in, in anticipation for that, you get this group of four trumpets in, in chapter 8, and now we got the fifth and sixth trumpets, which are called the woes, right? And um, that are going to come on in the world. So this was, um, what do you call it? Oh, I got two slides up. Trying not to be a slide ahead. I did that the other week, and I don't want to do that again. I'm moving stuff around. Give me a second, and I'll be right with you. Now I can see them. Okay. So on slide number eight, we start describing these locusts that are coming out to um, out of this bottomless pit. And I want you to see... Um, a, a, a metaphor doesn't use like or as. A simile does, right? And watch how much the word like shows up here. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads was something what looked like crowns of gold. And their faces were like human faces, and their hair was like woman's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle they have tails and stings like scorpions and their uh, power was to hurt people five months and is in their tail and they have a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit and it, his name in hebrew is abaddon and in greek it's called apollyon and the first woe has passed. Behold, two more woes are still to come. Okay. So here Beale says, His vision of locusts, like horses prepared for battle, is clearly related to Joel's portrayal of the plague of locusts attacking Israel. Itself is modeled after the plague of locusts in Exodus 10. So just as we saw before, and I'm going to pause here, reading Beale. Joel, as a prophet, has taken an imagery from Exodus 10 and repurposed it in his prophecy and get, made a new theological point. Exactly like we saw Isaiah take something from Genesis or Deuteronomy or Psalms and then or another earlier prophet and then make a theological point with it. And then we watch the New Testament writers take what Isaiah wrote and repurpose that to make a new theological point. This pattern is all through scripture. And so what Beale is pointing you out to is that John's referring back to Joel 
But ultimately, he's re referring back to Exodus 10. Okay, that imagery. And as God used locusts to judge Egypt, so when Joel, uh, God is portrayed as using locusts to judge unrepentant Israel, out of which only a remnant will be saved. Joel 2, 31 and 32. There's our remnant again. It keeps, uh, they go through the judgment, but they come out the other side. Joel mirrors the thought of Exodus that the primary purpose of the locust plague was to harden the hearts of unbelievers. Joel's locust, whether literal or representing enemy armies, right? So Beale's telling you can mean either one, brought famine. You see that in Joel 1, 5 to 12 and 16 uh, to 20. And in chapter 2, 25 and anguish. You see that in uh, Joel 2, 6. And the prophets sometimes spiritualize famine. You see that in Amos uh, 8, 1 to, or 11 to 14. But this suggests the actual famine conditions observed in the first three trumpets ultimately point to punishments coming upon sinners because of their spiritual famine and barrenness in their souls. So you have a, a double entendre here. You're, you're having a spiritual famine, but he's saying it's very likely a literal famine as well. And I think the four horse judgment indicate the judgments that we've seen in the four horsemen indicate a literal famine. And the judgment we've seen in the first four trumpets indicates there's going to be literal famine, widespread famine. And that it it's a judgment coming on the earth why because of spiritual corruption and and unrepentantness of by man and you've seen the same thing in the old testament we've seen the same thing in isaiah when we did it this is this is god repeats this okay, and then i highlighted for you in the same uh verses okay they have as their king over them the angel of the bottomless pit his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek it's Apollyon. Now this means the like destroyer and, um, what do you call it? Um, in Hebrew and Greek it means destroyer, and Abaddon is closely linked to Sheol, or the place of death in the Old Testament. So just like Satan isn't a proper name, Satan means accuser. These are other names for some fallen angel who is a destroyer and is connected to Sheol or hell. Okay, and you're going to see that connection between uh, this Abaddon and Sheol in Job 26 and Job 28 and Psalm 88 and Proverbs 15 and 27. And these names together with the statement that the angel is king over what Beale calls demons, and I'll deal with that in a minute, suggests that this is either Satan himself or one of his most powerful representatives. Okay. This could be an underling to Satan, but he's definitely on, on it. It's either Satan himself or an underling. I lean towards the Satan side, but, you know, there's good arguments made for the other one. And you're going to see him show up again in Revelation 12 and 13, all the way from 12 uh, and into all of chapter 13. And they're compatible with this conclusion since the, there the devil and the beast are pictured respectively with kingly diadems on their head and as leaders of the forces. This is in line with the same conclusion already reached about the angel's identification in 9-1 being Satan, right? The two names of Satan expressed in his function in utilizing um, what Beale's calling demons to work among the impious so that they will eventually be destroyed by death of the body and spirit. The demonic activity lasting only five months is but part of a process leading to this final uh, macabre um, goal. The sixth uh, trumpet pictures the completion of this process. Okay, so Beale is taking these Old Testament passages and saying, what did they mean in the Old Testament? And they're going to mean the same thing again. Okay, so um, he has a consistent fairly consistent interpretive methodology and uh, we're we're following that same kind of methodology is what do these passages mean in the Old Testament John's alluding to them you know pretty clearly what's John want us to see right 
And I'm telling you, I'm quoting Bill extensively because I find his methodology, he and other scholars like uh, Michael Heiser are using, to be correct. But you will find things in his writing of any teacher. I don't care who you listen to, including me. You're going to find things I say you're going to disagree with. If you agree with everything I say, one of us is not thinking. Okay? So if you're going to critique everything I say and everything every other teacher says, you're going to find stuff you disagree with. I'm very impressed with Beal. But I think he's wrong to call them demons. Right? Or to talk about it uh, demonic. Because what's in chains in the bottomless pit are sons of God. The Benai Elohim. Right? What Peter and Jude call angels. So he's making the assumption that fallen angels are demons. And I don't see anything in scripture that supports that assumption. When we find angels in the Old Testament, they possess the ability to manifest physical bodies. Sometimes those bodies are fantastical looking and clearly present the idea of a, a heavenly uh, being coming there. And sometimes they present bodies that so closely resemble humans that it says some of us have entertained them without even realizing they're angels. And that's in Hebrews 13, 2 to 4. The Benai Elohim in Genesis 6, 1 to 4 were able to manifest bodies so close to humans in appearance and, and that they uh, were able to mate and produce offspring. Okay? And we're told by God that uh, every animal produces after its kind. So whatever they did, uh, they were able to get close enough to our genetic makeup to produce offspring. Now, uh, in every place we find demons, they're seeking embodiment. They don't, they don't have the ability to produce bodies. They're looking to be in bodies. And when Jesus cast out the demons out of the demoniac, they asked permission to go into the pigs in Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 to 34. They want embodiment, possession. You don't ever see an angel seeking to possess anybody, but you see demons do it. So I just don't see this uh, common understanding that demons are fallen angels to be in Scripture. But I have speculated, and I put speculated in yellow because I want you to catch this. This is speculation from Bill. That what we think of as demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. If the Nephilim's fathers were Benai Elohim, sons of God, celestial beings, they are not mortal. But the mothers were mortal. When God killed the Nephilim, both in the flood and then when it happens again and he sends uh, Joshua out to kill them in mass in, in the land in Canaan and, and destroy these giants, these Nephilim, if they have immortal fathers, immortal mothers, what happens to their spirit when they die? It's not going to heaven. Does it go to Sheol? Or are they destined to be wandering the earth until the final judgment? And so that led me to, like I said, it's a speculation. I can't prove that with scripture, but I think it's a reasonable speculation here that that's what's going on and where demons come from because you don't, you don't have a biblical explanation for the origin of demons. Okay, and then in verses 13 to 15, it says, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice in, from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel to, uh, who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound by the great river Euphrates. So the four angels had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year, and they were released to kill a third of mankind. Okay, well, who are these four angels? Well, first, let's deal with the guy that's by the horns of the golden altar. We saw that earlier in chapter 5. That's Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is given the command. He's that voice. He's the guy over by the horns of the golden altar. He's doing his uh, priestly duties, whether that's literal or figurative. He's doing his priestly duties by the golden altar, and he's releasing these four angels. But you're going, wait, who's the four angels? I thought the fallen angels went to the bottomless pit. Who are these angels chained by the river Euphrates, right? You know? And so here's Beale's commentary again. It says, the voice from the altar issues a command to the sixth 
trumpet angel to release the four angels who are bound by the great river Euphrates. They had been bound implies that they have been restrained against their will, like the demons, what he's calling demons, combined in the abyss from uh, chapter, Revelation 9, 1 to 3. They are probably also probably wicked angels. He's speculating here, right? I think he's correct with that speculation that they're they're a specific class of uh, fallen celestial being, right? You call them angels or celestial beings that they're there. The re Beale says the Euphrates does not refer to the literal place the angels were bound and will raise their armies, right? Rather, the regions around the Euphrates, and he's quoting Isaiah 7, 20 and 8, 7 and 8, and the land of the north by the river Euphrates from Jeremiah 46, 10, or simply the north, meaning the region of the Euphrates from Jeremiah 1, 14 to 15, 6, 1, 22 and 10, 22 and Ezekiel 38, 6 are mentioned in the Old Testament as the area from which the armies of destruction come, sometimes against Israel, sometimes against other nations. The strongest Old Testament echo comes from Jeremiah 46, which portrays the coming judgment on Egypt and the army of horsemen from the north being like serpents, innumerable locusts, having breastplates. And that's from Jeremiah 46, verses 4, and then 22 and 23. And being by the river Euphrates in Jeremiah 46, 2, likewise 46, 6, and 10. The angels have been bound by God and are now released by him since the command to release the enemy emanates from the divine altar in heaven. And when he's calling God, it's, it's Jesus acting as God because this is the revelation of Jesus in his divinity, in his role as creator, judge, lord, king, right? <clears throat> so that's all um, there. And then I continued about the release of the four angels who are bound by the rear of Euphrates because I want to point you to something that Dr. Michael Heiser wrote. If you, if you haven't read The Unseen Realm, it, it's going to open your eyes to a lot of different ways to, of seeing things. I don't agree with everything Heiser writes in The Unseen Realm, but he's, he hits enough right that it's a worthwhile read. Okay? And he points out, it goes in a lot of detail, showing that the cultures in the Near East saw that area of the north, specifically Israel, looked to the north as the the abode of, of basically the evil ones, the underworld, the entrance to the underworld. And up in the area of Bashan, uh, the hills of Bashan, and when it speaks of like the strong bulls of Bashan that surrounded Jesus on the cross, these are spiritual entities, okay? And he saw that. And part of the reason he saw that north is evil is because that's the direction most of the nations came from that attacked Israel. Uh, Assyria, Babylon, you know, they, they come out of the north. Okay, and so you had these giants who lived in the north hill country of Israel. And then you had this other one. It all builds into their uh, belief that equates north with evil. Okay, so by pointing it to the being the to the river Euphrates, which is kind of north and east of Israel, that points you to the, the abode of, of these uh, the underworld. And so that's the picture John's bringing here. Not that there's four literal angels bound underneath the river Euphrates or at the river, river Euphrates, and that they're there. He's bringing up imagery. Remember when we discussed apocalyptic language is to bring about an emotion in you. It's to make you feel something. And what it's feeling is the the uh, the idea that evil is coming and God's going to allow evil to come on. And as in the Old Testament parallels of the northern invader, so here is God who ultimately unleashes the corrupt angelic invaders. These angels could be identified with the angelic counterparts to the wicked nations who dwelled in the north of this boundary. You're going to see that where God does this in the Old Testament, where he speaks to like the king of Tyre. And then pretty soon you realize he's not talking to just an earthly king. He's talking to a spiritual entity behind it. In Daniel 10, there's a spiritual entity behind Babylon and, and um, verses 13 and 21. And looking back 
at, at Revelation 7 1 enables us to identify the four winds of the earth being held back with the four beings being bound at the rear of Euphrates. And that's what I'm saying. It's the same thing. In one metaphor, he talks about them, the four winds. Here he's talking about it, four angels. It's, it's evils being restrained. And it's being let loose. And look around the world now and, and understand this is evil being restrained. Wait when it's when God lets it all loose. Do you know what I'm saying? You think it's bad now? Cheer up, saints. It's going to get a lot worse. Right? You know? The destructive winds at the four corners of the earth may now be unleashed against the unsealed. Right? Because we already seen the the sealed by God are going to be protected. And um, this is from Beale on page 190 of his shorter commentary. So I'm hoping you're, you're following that he is following the same methodology we followed in Isaiah. And he's doing it relatively consistently, you know, not perfectly, but uh, he's staying pretty uh, consistent in, in the way he's approaching this. Heiser does the same thing. Heiser openly admits that every interpretive path, uh, grid has problems and that he's not um, stuck with any one of them. And uh, I just take a little different tack that I think there's some truth in all of them, right? So here is um, the number of this, this mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. So I did the math for you because you're going to hear prophecy teachers tell you that this is a 100 million man army and that the Chinese announced they could put 100 million men in the field and it was uh, prophecy teachers went nuts for this. They missed the word twice here. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million men, but it says twice. So that's 200 million men. China is the only nation on the world today that could possibly put forward anything remotely close to 200 million men. They currently, right now, cannot put 200 million men on the, on the field of battle, but they announced they could get to 100 million. And that's what made China uh, prophecy buffs go crazy. But that's what I mean about taking a passage out of context. They just leave the twice out of their equation when they go announce to you that uh, the 100 million man army proves this is China. Okay. And then um, now dispensational futurists take this book at least in a quasi literal, literally. Okay. They don't take it literally. And I've shown you that they don't. But they see these heli these uh, um, locusts as being hel attack helicopters, like Apache helicopters. And the hair of the women being like smoke coming out of their exhaust and uh, the sting in their tail, you know, is, is a rear rotor. And, uh, you know, that they really have um, uh, uh, colorful interpretations to make these helicopters. Uh, but they they see this as bolstering, not boltering, bolstering. Their, arm, their argument that this is China, and in a little while we're going to read about the U river Euphrates being dried up to make way for the kings of the east, and they go, see, China's in the east, the river Euphrates is in the east, it's going to get dried up, and they're going to walk out of China down into the Middle East, uh, except for Euphrates turns west, doesn't go, it goes from the southeast to the northwest, it doesn't lead up towards China, but we just don't present a map when we're going to help you understand that they're going to walk down the river Euphrates, right? You know? And uh, so others see this army as spiritual beings, like Beale has taken that position, which is even more literal than the dispensational futurists, right? But if we look back at the prologue and epilogue to Esther that I showed you in the Septuagint, we saw that fantastical imagery was used to describe human empires that was opposing the Jews. Right? So this the preterist and most historicists take this idea that this is just picturing Rome. And, and uh, the Rome was a persecutor of the Jews at the time, and that's all this is first doing. Now, I'm going to uh, take you back to Beale and show you how, when you apply the methodology we're doing, how you come up with a different interpretation. 
And he says, as with the description of the locusts in the fifth trumpet, the piling up of hideous descriptions underscores the demons, what he's calling demons, I'm calling but I owe him, right? As furious and dreadful beings, fire and brimstone in the Old Testament, sometimes linked with smoke, indicates fatal judgment, as it does here, with the course of history. And he points you a bunch of passages where that imagery is taken from. The idea of God's judgment on his en enemies is figuratively expressed, and you see it in 2 Samuel 22, 9 and Psalm 18, 8, by the phrase, similar phrase of smoke and fire from his mouth. In Revelation 11, 5, this expression, fire proceeds out of their mouth, refers to the punishment of the uh, two faithful witness execute against their persecutors. The fire is figurative reference to the prophesying in their testimony, and you know that from Revelation 11, 6, and 7. So, what, and I'm going to pause here. I want you to see that. He's saying if you're taking the fire figuratively in Revelation 11, it's also figuratively in Revelation 11, 5, right? You don't get to take it literally in one passage and then take it figuratively in the other. That this is, this kind of language is all through the Bible, and it, it talks about God's judgment. It's bringing to mind God's judgment. Okay? There, uh, when they, they prophesy in testimony, these are the two witnesses. They're going to end up getting killed uh, and spoken up about being killed and left laying in the street. It says, there the rejection of their testimony commences a spiritual judgment on the persecutors and lays out the basis for their future final judgment. And you're going to see that in Revelation 11 when we get there. That the image of fire um, proceeding from the mouth is figurative, is apparent from the other parallels in the book. For instance, Revelation 1, 6, uh, 2, 12, and 16, 19, 15, and 21 portray Christ judging his enemies by means of a sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth. You don't think Jesus is coming back with a literal sword sticking out of his uh, mouth, right? 2.16 alludes to some form of temporal punishment, whereas 19 and uh, 15 and 21 has to do with the defeat of Christ's enemies at his return. Like the fire in, in 11.5, the sword in Christ's mouth is figurative and probably refers to condemnation of sinners through his word, as implied in 19.11-13. The overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, 24, and 28 is uppermost in the thought among the possible parallels since the precise, precise combination of fire, smoke, and brimstone occurs in the Old Testament only there. So he thinks that John is, is alluding to all of these passages, but specifically referring back to the Genesis 9, 19 thing and the destruction of Sodom and to do that. And so he's not taking this as uh, a literal army of demons coming down and, and, and fighting and doing that, but this is figurative. Real judgment's coming, right? But it, it's probably not Apache helicopters and tanks and things, right? You know, but uh, they're seeing it. Now, in 18 to 21, it says, by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the sulfur coming out of their mouth. For the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. And for in their tails are like the uh, serpents with heads. And by means of them, they wound. And the rest of the mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshiping demons or idols of gold or silver or bronze and stone or wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent for their murders and their sorceries of their sexual immorality or their thefts. Okay? So th this passage tells you why the judgment's coming and that it doesn't result in people repenting. It results in them hardening their hearts against God. Right? They're, they're absolutely hard in their heart. If they're given final chance to repent and, and to come to God, but they don't do it. Now, when it says none happen, I think that's hyperbole. 
there may be some people that actually do repent, but it, it's speaking in a generalized sense, right? But you could, I could still see people being saved all through the tribulation. And, and almost every interpretive grid sees people being saved during the tribulation. So you, you can't even take that, that none of the people repented in a strict literal sense. It's, it's hyperbole. It's, it's using hyperbole to make a point that almost nobody turned around and turned to God during this time, right? <clears throat> now, I got a long quote from Beelan. It's not going to fit on one slide, so I broke this up. It says, The power of the horses lies not only in their mouths, but also their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. This does not mean that the horses literally have serpents as their tails. For as the first part of the verse comments generally and implicitly on the similarity of the tails of the demonic horses to serpents, the second part continues the metaphor by saying that harm inflicted by the heads on the serpent-like tails is as lethal as a serpent who bites. The piling on of metaphors, which we saw in Isaiah, right? not completely consistent with one another these these metaphors are like conflicting metaphors exactly what isaiah did right and they're not consistent with one another is not for the purpose of portraying a nicely systematic or logical picture or a literal but bizarre creature at home in the science fiction novel right but to bring an emphasis in the same way it is not in line with that intention of 5-8 to ask how each elder was able to play a harp and hold a bowl of incense at the same time. And I passed that up when we got the 5-8, but if you notice, the 24 elders were holding a bowl of incense in their hands and playing a harp. Uh, that's a pretty good trick. Nobody asked how they can do that. and You're not going to see anybody's commentary that brings up that question because it's not literal that they're holding a bowl of incense and playing the harp, right? Those are images, metaphors, bringing for uh, images in your mind, right? And then Beale's going to continue here. It may be helpful to note, and, and there's a break. This was not, I, I took a section of a Beale's quote and then went way down the page and took another section, okay? It may be helpful to note that the combination of serpents and scorpions in Revelation 9, 3 to 19 right, reflects the broader linkage in biblical ancient Jewish thought, right, where the combination was metaphorical for judgment, metaphorical for judgment in general and the deception or delusion in particular. And he points you to Deuteronomy 8.15. Now, some of these books are, are not in the Bible, and then he's using Jewish uh, uh, Talmud and Mishnah uh passages. So he's basically doing a survey and in his longer commentary, the one that's 1300 and whatever pages, he actually takes you through the survey of these other sources to show that in Jewish thought, in their variety of writings, this imagery was used repeatedly to uh, talk to you in, in repeatedly in a metaphorical sense for judgment. It was never taken literally. And he's making an argument here. It wasn't taken literally in all these other cases. Why are you taking it literally here? The reference is to fiery serpents. And, and that fiery serpents, I'm going to interject here. A seraphim in the Bible is a fiery serpent. Okay? And uh, which is similar to the threefold repetition of fire in connection with the serpent's in Revelation 9, 17 to 19, in the Numbers passage, their bite, as here, kills a significant portion of the people because of the unbelief. Because of their unbelief, they, they die, right? And then um, in the Sirach um, book, 39, chapter 39, 27 to 31, provides a striking parallel with Revelation 9, 3 and 4, 15 to 19, which reflects Jewish and biblical tradition Standing in the background of John's train of thought, all these things are for good to the godly, so the sinners, they are turned into evil. There be spirits that are created for vengeance, which their fur fury lay on the sore strikes. 
In the time of destruction, they pour out their force and appease the wrath of him who made them. The wrath of him who made them is God, right? Fire and death and all these were created for vengeance. Scorpions and serpents punishing the wicked to destruction. And they shall be uh, prepared to earth when it need when need is. And when their time is come, they shall not go beyond his word. Okay, so Beal has just, in a, in a, in a long um, section, explained to you that this is how Jews understood this imagery. And that it is repeated not only in scripture, but in non-scriptural books that they used, right? In, the, in apocryphal books like Syri Syriac and, and Midrash and other writings. It, it's also going to show up in um, the Talmud and Mishnah. And so this is a consistent thought. And so if we're going to interpret this literally, we are going to ignore the Jewish context of this book. Follow me, right? It's, let me, let me switch back to uh, me chatting for a minute and I'll talk to you for just a second. And I know I ran over, and I'm trying to get out of here for bending knee. I thought I had a short um, um, subject, but um, hopefully you got a couple more minutes for me. And I'll I want to I'm gonna put a song on real quick. I'm gonna go read the uh, the chat, and then I will come back and uh, uh, talk to you real quickly, and then we'll all go over to bend a knee. Okay. Hopefully I'll be on before Michael's prayer starts. Right. You know. And. Uh, Thank you. Let me let me get a. Oh, sorry, I'm failing on. Uh, I'm getting a song. Let me do this quickly.
Okay, I'm cutting these off a little short, but I'm trying to finish here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Patricia, about whether or not fire and brimstone can be uh, volcanoes or whatever. I've seen attempts to, uh, like, explain uh, the plagues of Egypt and with naturalistic uh, phenomenon. Um, I don't see that working very well, but, I mean, it could be, right, you know? And then... Um, you know, God can use natural things, but at one point there was, uh, you know, we had fire and brimstone rain down out of heaven and kill an army. Two armies were on the field and the brimstone only hit one of them. If God put a comet in, in cycle for millions of years or thousands of years or however long he had it up there uh, so that it would fall into orbit at just the right time for the um, pieces of the comet to only kill the enemy army, uh, that's even more miraculous than God sending fire and brimstone out of heaven, right? You know, but it's uh, it's wonderful. I mean, it, it can be any of those things. I think we don't want to get nailed down into any particular uh, literal in, interpretation of that. Just understand it is judgment from God. And then are we in the spiritual famine? I think there's periods of time in our history where we've been in spiritual famine. I think this is one of them. I think it is embarrassing how little most Christians know about the Christian faith and, and their own faith or the Bible and how much uh, false doctrine that we are willing to embrace and the people that try to focus on um, right doctrine, how unloving they tend to be. Uh, and I'm, I'm using generalizations and, I, and that's not the case. It just tends, from my perspective, a lot of people that try to hold people to straight doctrine tend to fall into uh, getting a very unloving attitude. They, they forget their love, just like we saw the letter to Ephesus that Jesus wrote. You know, you got to do this. And in when he he tells you and, and St. Peter about always be an answer to give, um, always be ready to give an answer um, to the hope that lies within you to anyone that asks. Do this in gentleness and fear, or meekness and kindness, basically. To be kind about it when you do it. I see that happening. And then you have the other side with like the Corinthian church where people are just completely out of whack doing crazy things. Uh, but I see I, we, as being in a time of spiritual famine. And um, I, I think this is going to lead that we are looking at a time possibly in the very near future a very literal famine. Um, if things don't change, it's coming. But um, does that mean I think we're at the end times and we're at the beginning of the book of Revelation? Not necessarily. There's been worse times in history than there is now. Um, you know, I think if you look at history for like in the in the 6th century AD in the 500s, there was so much bad stuff going on. Uh, you would have had to think that the end of the world was coming. You know, I mean, it was, it was horrible. Uh, so I just don't see that. But with that, I want to get over to Bend a Knee, and God bless you all, and hopefully I'll see you over there. And uh, thanks for tuning in, and with any any luck from God, I will be here on uh, Friday teaching. And if uh, you don't get a um, notification I'm here, it's just I get overwhelmed. And, and God bless you all.